light on one of the greatest scientific mysteries of all time. But the substantial reward caught everyone's attention. Then, in December 1952, from the Comoros, Smith got the telegram he'd hoped and prayed for for 14 years. It came from an English sea trader he'd met in Madagascar, Eric Hunt. Have five-foot specimen coelacanth. Injected formalin here. Killed 20th. Advise. Smith was beside himself. Did Hunt have enough preservative? It would take weeks to reach the Comoros by boat. By then, the fish might putrefy. He'd not spent all these years searching to let this specimen slip away. Smith turned to his connections in the South African government to try to borrow a plane, finally calling on the Prime Minister himself, D. F. Milan. Milan was at his beach cottage in, in 1952 when he got that famous phone call from J.L.B. Smith and he realized that J.L.B. Smith had something important to tell him, that South Africa's prestige was at stake. Mike As a South African, Mike Bruton remembers the story of the second coelacanth well. And uh, as a result, Milan eventually gave permission for that military Dakota to fly to the Comores, since being described as a sort of a military aeroplane going to a foreign country, taking a mad scientist to fetch a dead fish. Well, this is uh, Dakota 6832, the one that we flew to fetch the coelacanth in 1952. Major General Duncan Ralston was a lieutenant at the time and the senior navigator on the flight that took J.L.B. Smith to the Comoros. Professor Smith actually sat about here and um, he was so tense and so excited. We had a long flight over the sea. There was almost no navigation aids. But we landed and there was the fish. The fish smelled strongly of the formaldehyde Hunt had used to try to preserve it. And it was a bit the worse for wear, having been carted across the island by the fishermen who caught it. Nevertheless, after 14 years of searching, Smith finally had his coelacanth. I could not bring myself to touch it. And I knelt down to look, and I'm not ashamed to say, and that after all that long strain, I wept. Professor Smith insisted that we get this fish back to the airplane and take off as quickly as possible. I'm not sure to this day whether we did in fact have proper diplomatic clearance to land at the island or to take the fish away. I know subsequently the French government were enormously cross about the whole affair because they felt it belonged to them. So we flew back. We had to fly the fish down to Cape Town because uh, Dr. Malon wanted to see it. Dr. Malon said when he saw the fish, why it's very ugly and is this where we came from? Malon was a creationist and the father of South African apartheid. Aiding Smith in his evolutionary research was dangerous politically. But South Africa's prestige was at stake, and Milan welcomed the publicity. This is Movie Town. Donald Marson reporting. Meet Professor Smith of Grahamstown, South Africa, with a model of that famous fish, the coelacanth. Coelacanths are close relatives of the fish that scientists consider was the ancestor of all land animals. The coelacanths have lived for probably 350 million years, and in that time they have changed but little. Yes, the professor says the fish is a kind of ancestor of man. Poor fish. In his lab, Smith began the first ever dissection of a coelacanth peering into a world never before accessible to science. What he discovered 
was that the coelacanth is different in many ways from all other modern fish. Not only did it have strange limb-like fins, it had no real backbone. Instead, Smith found a more primitive structure called a notochord. This is part of the notochord of the coelacanth that was dissected here. And it's simply a, a, a hollow tube. It's a gristly tube which extends from just behind the brain right through into the tail. And it's filled with a light oil under a very slight pressure. This kind of oil-filled skeletal structure is unique. Most adult vertebrates have well-developed backbones, especially those that live on land, including human beings. The entire fish is, is filled with oil. There's not a single air sinus in the fish. So, like a diver's depth gauge, it's incompressible, which, in theory anyway, would allow it to swim on a depths of a thousand meters or, or more. But it was the limb-like fins that really caught the attention of Smith and the world. They had their own internal skeleton, more like our limbs than the fins of a normal fish. As you see, the fins are more like paddles than ordinary fins. Indeed, our arms were developed from a pectoral fin like that of this fish. I have no doubt that this fish falls about on the bottom quite easily. Once again, the press trumpeted the coelacanth as the missing link, a creature that bridged the gap between fish and primitive land animals. Scientists, museums, even zoos now wanted their own coelacanth. The London Zoo offered a reward of a thousand pounds for a live specimen. Smith capitalized on the excitement surrounding his find. He wrote a book, Old Four Legs, and created a